So we're driving around, bored as usual. There never seems to be enough to do when you're a teenager. And it's not just because we live in Wallingford. I've known kids from Manhattan who say the same thing, and they live in the greatest city in the world, for Christ's sake. For lack of anything better to do, I suggest we take a ride over to Cramptown and look at the house I first lived in when we moved from Hoboken and didn't know any better. Being a Cramptowner herself, Paula is very sensitive on the subject and complains that all of us Wallies are snobs. But as far as I'm concerned, being accused of snobbery just confirms that you have something to be snobby about. Anyway, we take a ride by the house because that's the kind of thing you do when you're bored on a hot summer night. The house is a split-level ranch, not unlike Aunt Glow's, essentially a garage with a house attached to it. But it's what's in front that immediately gets our attention. There, in the middle of a bed of anemic-looking pansies, is possibly the ugliest lawn ornament I've ever set my eyes on. I mean, we're not talking some innocuous little lawn jockey here, no. But a hideous, three-foot-tall, green ceramic Buddha. His pudgy arms reaching up gleefully, his sloppy man breaths hanging over his huge, distended belly, his toothless grin twisted into a horrendous and slightly disturbing spasm of joy. I can't fucking believe it. There's a Buddha on my memories. In a moment of blazing insight, I spontaneously leap from the car and start tucking and rolling my way across the lawn like I'm avoiding snipers. I can hear my friend's bewildered cries behind me, but that only invigorates me all the more as I zigzag across the lawn to the Buddha and plop my Burger King crown on his head at a rakish angle. I swear it was like he was meant to wear it. It's almost like he's smiling because he knows he looks so snazzy. In that moment, the manifesto for the summer of magic and mischief is born. We call it creative vandalism. Our commitment is to bring a Bobby and a Chorus Line kind of flair and vitality to the sleepy New Jersey suburbs, but with Paula's proviso that we don't do any damage to personal property or engage in any illegal activity. Such a Paula proviso to have. So, when they make the movie of my life, the summer of 1983 has to be one of those montage sequences filled with madcap adolescent hijinks. Not the dumb shit you usually see in most movies like lip-syncing into hairbrushes or squirting each other with a hose while washing a car. No, you'll see the cool creative vandalism stuff we really do. Like putting department store mannequins in compromising positions. Or hopping into the freezer section of the grocery store to pretend to be the cryogenically frozen Walt Disney. We call it Disney on Ice. You'll see us on those summer nights as we tool around in the Lincoln Continental Divide, Paula the designated driver, the rest of us the designated drunks, putting dishwashing liquid in the fountain downtown till it bubbles over, sending Paula's enormous bra up the school flagpole, drawing a hula hoop around the guy in the crosswalk sign, and of course, visiting the Buddha. Time after time, you'll see me tucking and rolling my way across the lawn to dress him up, first in Paula's communion veil, then in Doug's jockstrap, then in Aunt Glow's old flowered bathing cap. Each time, the Buddha blissfully, almost freakishly happy to be so arrayed. You'll see me and Doug dragging the Buddha to the front door and setting him up with a breakfast tray of orange juice, toast, and half a grapefruit balanced on top of his outstretched hands, ready to deliver Buddha room service and you'll see us ringing the bell in the middle of the night so that the owners will find him lying on their doorstep, a Hawaiian lay around his neck, and an empty bottle of Southern Comfort next to him, as if he'd passed out after a wild night at some swingin' Buddha bar. Mm -hmm.